George Soros. Well, I mean, look, you don't have to travel far if you pay attention to any, especially right-wing media, you're going to hear the name Soros at some point in time. Foreign-born billionaires, been a political activist for every left-wing cause for years. Now George's son Alex has taken over lots of that now that Daddy Eyebags is getting a little bit too old for it. And what do you know? Tim Walls was just pictured sitting with Soros the second time they've met in the last month. But what influence do these people have on street crime, which seems to be going up? Let's talk to Matt Murphy. I had him on my radio show last week. He was so good. He's got this sick book up, which we'll get to in a minute. Matt, you are former DA. The Soroses, what are they doing on the ground? How does it, how does it affect crime in LA, Chicago, cities? What are they doing? Well, I think the way it affects uh, crime in LA and some of these other cities um, is sort of readily apparent for anybody who lives there. Um, you, you've got essentially the whole defund the police movement. Um, there, there's more than one way to skin that cat. And the Soros organization has embraced that wholeheartedly and they backed um, these so-called quote unquote progressive DAs who come in, um, they're very eager to prosecute police officers, but it seems like pretty much nobody else. And what, what you see is you see crime waves striking a lot of these cities. And, you know, um, if you live in L.A., I grew up here. Skid Row used to be about four blocks. Now it is mile after mile after mile. The, the only city I've ever been to that compares to it is Mumbai, India. You know, you just see these homeless encampments going oh. forever. And and look, those people, um, uh, tragic as it may be. Um, a lot of them are street addicts and to support those drug habits, they steal, they rob. Um, a lot of them have been paroled from state prison. A lot of them committed violent felonies in the past and will do so in the future. Um, and it's just a, it's a friggin' disaster for the city of Los Angeles. And by the way, you know, you said, you said something that just caught my ear. You, you talked about right wing media covering this. This has really nothing to do in my view with, with anybody's politics. Like if you're a Democrat or you're a Republican you're in the middle or you've never voted in your life. If you got kids, man, you got to pay attention to this stuff. This guy rolled in. He's the former DA of San Francisco. He came in. He he unseated a woman who was a lifelong Democrat um, who I respect to death. Her name is Jackie Lacey. First woman DA of Los Angeles County. First black person who's DA of, of Los Angeles County. And she did the job. And everybody liked her. Victims liked her. Police liked her. Her prosecutors liked her. But she wasn't far enough left uh, for for some of the people like the source organization. And they they funded this guy who came in his very first day. Um, he issued these sweeping edicts concerning enhancements and some of the legal uh, reform that happened in the 1990s after some of the horrific revolving door justice that we had. And he is undoing that. So the, the term progressive just drives me crazy. And I'm, I'm a politically very moderate guy. I consider myself to be right in the middle on most issues. But when it comes to this, it is, it's madness what they're doing. There's nothing progressive about this. This is regressive policy that is taking us back to the revolving door um, justice system that we had in the 1970s and 80s. Yeah, there he is on the screen. That's my guy. I represented the families of two police officers who were murdered in the line of duty. And this guy did everything he could, that guy right there, to get those, to get the killers of those police officers out of custody. And it was outrageous. We fought him in court. Fortunately, on those two cases, we won. But um, there's an election coming up. There's a guy named Nathan Hockland who's running against that turkey. And um, for the voters of Los Angeles who care about public safety, they got to educate themselves on this. That man is not a, is not a friend of victims. That man is not a friend to these poor neighborhoods that these guys get paroled out into. And it, let me, and I'm sorry to rant here for you, but let me just give you one no. example of one of the policies he issued the very first day. There's a thing called BPT lifer hearings. That's the border prison terms. Lifers in the state of California include child molesters, rapists, and murderers. Those are essentially the three categories that you can do life in prison for. His very first day, what you do on those things is you, every DA, every responsible DA in the state of California and probably every state in America, when a life prisoner comes up, they send one of their deputies with the file from the DA's office to go in and to review it and to ensure that if that person poses a risk, 
that they're there with the correct information to explain it to the board to make sure that guy doesn't get out if he continues to pose a risk to public safety. That is routinely done. That was something that I did as a part of my job for 17 years. Physically go to the prison, and if the guy is denying it, if he's not showing proper remorse, if the victim's family is still traumatized, whatever it may be that poses a continuing risk, you make sure the board knows that so that they can issue an informed decision. He immediately forbade all of his prosecutors from going and doing that. I get into it with one of his uh, with one of his main lieutenants on the phone one day, and it just it is unreal that they did that. And the, the voters of Los Angeles have no clue that that was one of the first things. It is horrific for public safety, and it's destroying the city that I love and that I grew up in. Yeah, it is a shame, too, man. I didn't even recognize L.A. last time I touched down. And, man, I've had some great times in that city. You know, I, I don't I don't want to leave this stuff exactly, but I want to talk very, very briefly about the, the P. Diddy thing. Now, I don't do a lot of entertainment pop talk, and I don't care about that stuff. And it's a family show, and it's really, really gross, a lot of the stuff that I've seen about that. But this case is a really, really big deal for a variety of reasons. Why? Well, I can tell you one thing about the Diddy case is, you know, when we saw those all those famous videos of them rolling in in the Bearcats, those are those uh, those military vehicles with the long guns, um, that was in Los Angeles County. And when you look at this case, you know, he's accused and he's presumed innocent. I got to say that as a practicing lawyer. But, um, you know, these are when you're talking about the sexual abuse in mass and a systematic organization that he's accused of using to effectuate the, these instances of sexual abuse, and we'll see, this is going to be a sensational trial. But the one person that was not on that stage, you know, when this thing came down, again, was George Gascon. And it was the same thing in the Matthew Perry case. That was a drug ring that was busted up that, that was charged essentially with running amok in the city of Los Angeles that supplied Matthew Perry the drugs that ultimately killed him. And, you know, when we saw John Belushi, when he got that hot shot back in the day, that person was prosecuted by the Los Angeles DA's office. When Michael Jackson died... That person, Dr. Murray, was prosecuted properly by the Los Angeles DA's office. Now, it's what we're seeing in L.A. is we're seeing these federal agencies coming in to enforce law in the city of Los Angeles. And that is a direct result of these of the Soros organization. Defund the police is one of the dumbest things ever uttered in a public comment section. It's emotional. It's like we're dealing with teenagers. But that guy right there, George Gascon, what he did is. He, he's running a 300 prosecutor deficit in his office right now. Imagine that. 300 lawyers down out of, a, out of an office of about 1,000 when it's operating correctly. So one of the ways he's done to not enforce crime is he just hasn't hired new prosecutors. And those that are working for him have, have been leaving in mass because he's a nightmare to work for. So, it's, uh, so the Diddy case is another example of a case in Los Angeles that if, it was, if we had proper law enforcement, this is not the police. This is the election of that guy, former DA of San Francisco, George Soros. He he is he treats victims horribly. Um, in my opinion, he's the worst thing for public safety. In my opinion, that has ever happened to this city. Yeah, he is. Matt, I want to talk about your book, The Book of Murder. I mean, you talk about serial killers. Let's just stay on that here. What's it like? Because you have to, you have to have intimate knowledge of this stuff, Matt. I don't even like watching one of my wife's sicko documentaries about this serial killer or that serial killer. But you have to, you have to dig into all the details, and doesn't that affect you? How do you eat breakfast after digging into the sick crap these people do? Well, you know, um, I, I my plan was I was going to be a DA for three years, and and what happens is you. You meet the victims' families. You you meet these moms, and um, oh, uh, you, you know you you work for them, really. You 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 want to um, you want to do what you can to bring justice to the victims' families. And what we do in Orange County, it's a vertical system. So uh, we we wind up going to the scene and we follow the case from the ground all the way up. And it becomes a part of your life. And one of them, one of the chapters in that book is about a guy named Rodney Alcala. Anna Kendrick has an amazing movie coming out on Netflix um, that I got to help out a little bit on, which is a huge honor to do. Um, and look, he's kind of a perfect example. This guy was a, uh, he was a true blue American serial killer, kidnapped and raped an eight-year-old girl in 1968. Um, and he fled to New York 
and he was caught in New York. He was extradited back to California. He received a life sentence back in the early 70s. And this guy, Rodney Alcala, uh, was paroled after 34 months. And after his parole, he probably murdered about 100 people, if you do the math. And we, we prosecuted him between oh. Orange County and Los Angeles County. We, we prosecuted him for five. Uh, he did at least five that we know of in New York, one probably in Vermont, another one he was charged with in Wyoming. He was cleared to one in Marin County outside of San Francisco, um, probably one in Texas. Um, certainly, he's suspected of two more in San Diego. So this guy was an absolute monster. He had a life sentence in 1971. He was paroled after 34 months, and he went on a killing spree. And, you know, a lot of these guys... Um, you know, sex workers are absolutely, in my experience, they are worthy of our sympathy and our support. The, the, you know, women, especially if they're addicts, they go down a rabbit hole, and but they put themselves in positions of vulnerability, and they tend to be the targets of serial killers. Where Rodney Alcala did, Rodney Alcala was preying on women um, that aren't making bad decisions necessarily in their life or don't or aren't struggling with with you know. The horrors of addiction. He was following women home from bars. He his victims included a 12 year old girl in Huntington Beach named Robin Samso, uh, a woman in Malibu who's a pediatric cancer nurse named Georgia Wickstead, um, a legal secretary named Charlotte Lamb, a uh, computer programmer named Jill Parento. Like the list goes on and on and on. Like really nice people, and they were nice, young, and he had a type. They were beautiful. And he would murder them in the most sadistic manners possible. Like it just the stuff I saw in that case um, just would it, you'd make you lose sleep over it tonight um, if if I told you all the things that we saw in that. And that man never should have been out of custody, you know. And that's that's the world that um, people like George Soros and George Gascon are trying to take us back to. That those policies don't work. Innocent people suffer. Um, and uh, and they're they're doing everything they can to take us right back there. And you can either kind of throw your hands up and resign to it or decide you're going to fight. I've decided I want to fight, which is one of the reasons I'm really glad you had me on, on your show and asked me these questions. The public is they just don't know. People don't know. They don't know until they're the victims of violent crime or somebody that they love is murdered or raped. And that and they're doing everything they can to get these guys out of prison. And I can tell you right now, sex offenders do not reform. Sex offenders don't get better after therapy. In fact, there have been published academic studies indicating that they're the one demographic that actually gets worse with therapy. So they get better at, at getting away with it um, and they're harder to catch. But um, there is a certain percentage of our population going back to ancient Rome that is fundamentally predatory. And it's simple math. The more of those guys you keep in prison for longer periods, the more innocent people are safe. And statistically, the numbers bear that out. Um, and, and that's another thing. There's a, a great Mark Twain quote. There's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics, right? And I'll tell you, I've seen Gascon manipulate like the parole statistics. Um, that was a part of my job. I, I will debate that man or any of his ilk anytime, anywhere, and I will break down those numbers for the public it is shocking what they're doing, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come on here and try to raise some awareness to that. I'm glad you did, Matt. He is Matt Murphy, author. Go get the book of murder. How intense is that book going to be? And George Gascon, super fan. Matt Murphy. Matt, thank you, my brother. Please come back soon. I appreciate you. I would thank you for coming to my YouTube channel, but I know how brilliant it is, and I know you love it here. So subscribe and watch. We're going to start really ramping things up and putting some funny stuff, some interesting stuff out there, some collaborations. Either way, my YouTube channel is officially the place to be. So stick around.